Hello and welcome to the Stories of Generation Growth, a new series from Changemakers featuring high growth firms from the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses alumni. I'm Michael Heyman and throughout this series I'll be joined by my guest Charlotte Keenan, the program's head. Together we will speak with business leaders who could well be at the heart of a new generation of growth for the UK. But what is generation growth? Well, it's an idea driven by the Small Business Manifesto, a call to action which shares insights and policy ideas on how we can release the potential of high growth companies to thrive. We'll be discussing the key recommendations of that manifesto and how we make them real. Our guest today is Darcy Laceby, who at just 20 years old, co-founded the award-winning supplements business Absolute Collagen with her mum, Maxine, in 2015. Darcy, Charlotte, welcome to Changemakers. Darcy, what a business, absolute collagen. I'm here looking at the uh, the mango and mandarin flavor. Um, I'm, I'm hoping it tastes good, but tell us what it does for you. <laughs> <laughs> so collagen is a massive market now. Um, it's basically used as sort of like an anti-aging. That's kind of like how it's marketed. Um, we, however, started through developing a product that helped my mum feel more confident and feel more like better in herself. Um, so essentially, collagen is a massive molecule. Um, we're constantly breaking it down in our body. Um, and that visibly looks like kind of fine lines and wrinkles, but it's so much more than that. It's in your gums, it's in your teeth, even your bones. Um, so as we age, we need to replenish it. And that's what our supplement does, really. Charlotte, you and I have been talking a lot but our about absolute collagen. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure you've got a question. I mean, now's the time to ask you. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I've got many questions <laughs> because I'm your target audience here. But what I'm curious is, you know, the the, the, the background to this. I mean, you started this uh, 20, 2017, right? Mm -hmm. And you talked about wanting your mum to feel and look great. But there's a big step from that to, you know, the science that you've just talk to us about and you know, was telling us about before the interview. Tell us more about that. Yeah. So I'll go a bit into the background about how we actually started and how we <laughs> actually came up with that little yellow sachet. So when I was 18, I went off to university to do food science. My mum is crazy. Like she's she's nuts. Um, but she essentially She'll went to She'll listen to this. Yeah, <laughs> she will. And she will agree Be with Be kind, me. Darcy. Um, that's the my mother's lesson. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> so she went to do a fine art degree at the same time. Um, midlife crisis, I'm not sure. Um, She's still listening. Yeah, still listening, yeah. still there. But part of her degree, she essentially decided to do a project. She called it Dare to Go Bare. Uh, she cut all her hair off, took the colour out. It went kind of orange. Um, she got this tattoo and a nose piercing and turned up my bedroom door one day. And I was like, oh my goodness, what are you doing? Uh, she realised she wasn't very confident. The whole point of that was to kind of see how the world reacts realized it was more about her perception of herself and that she kind of didn't have the confidence, but it wasn't other people. It was how she treated herself. So started looking at kind of more of like a holistic wellness approach, started looking at what she was putting in her body. And that's where she started drinking and taking her own bone broth. Um, her friends were like, what are you doing? You look more confident. You've got a, more of a spring in your step, I guess. Um, and she was like, well, I'm taking this collagen stuff. Like, do you want some? At the same time, From I the could bone use... broth. Yeah, exactly. Gave the collagen. Bone yeah. broth and collagen are quite similar. Okay. In ways, but collagen is way more effective in terms of what it does, um, in terms of bioavailability and how it works. Um, so I could use the labs at uni to take the bone broth and have a look at it and see what we're actually doing here, make sure we're not going to hurt anyone, uh. making something up in the kitchen. And then it kind of went from there, really. We developed um, a product with 8,000 milligrams of marine collagen, um, highly sustainable, highly bioavailable. So Darcy, I'm, I'm looking at the absolute collagen um I suppose, tagline formulated for you. And I'm thinking about me and I'm thinking, well, <laughs> do I do I believe it? Does it work? Um, is it a marketeer's dream? Um, I'm presuming you're going to say as a scientist, this is the real deal. Well, I'm very data-led in what I do. So my mum came up with the formula. It worked for her. We now have hundreds of thousands of, of customers or happy customers that it works for them too. Um, but last year, late last year, we conducted the largest... Um, clinical trial on a collagen supplement ever. It was independent, double-blind, placebo-controlled. And there were some astounding results in that, really. After 12 weeks, 20% increase in skin elasticity compared to minus five on the placebo. Like, there's some great stats. I can promise you it does. For, for those of, the, of us that are thinking, what's it like to go into business with your mum? Yeah. What, what, what have you found it? What's been the... I mean, I suppose, are, are there any moments where the sort of like, um, the sort of parental dynamic... Kicks, uh, kicks in. in, like, go to your room or something. <laughs> How's you know it work? What? Me and my mum have a really interesting relationship. Like, we're not 
best friends. We're not like mummy daughter kind of you know right. go shopping together we would never go shopping um we've always had like a really respectful relationship her and my dad split up when I was 12 um so it's just been me and my, mom and my sister and she's trusted us to do anything I could do anything when I was little right like I, there was no boundaries I would never do anything but there was no boundaries and she's very much like that in business it was always like okay Darcy, that's your area I'm not gonna mother you I guess um and you need to run with that and I'm going to trust you to do it. And it's always been like that. We do speak to each other very direct. And I think people will always say, oh, I really want to work with my kids. And they romanticize about it and it's all lovely. But it's actually really hard work and the risks are really high if it goes wrong. I mean, so it's an excellent how, dynamic, right? I mean, and, and also one, how, I don't know how repeatable that is. But how, how do you split the roles yeah. within within <laughs> the business? And what is it? Does your sister feel left out or does she... Oh, my sister. Join in? <laughs> so she's like, so my sister is kind of like, guys... I'm just fed up of hearing you talk about it. So she kind of joined us when she went to uni and then uh, left after year and then came on. So she now does all our social media. So she reports it to me at the moment, which is really strange. I was going to say that dynamic. must be, that that must be like a, that a tough dynamic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's often asked about, you know, are, are entrepreneurs born or made? I mean, you know, it sounds like you've had both, right? You know, that you've had this incredible environment that has created the, um, the conditions for a free thinker, but also the support of... Um, a co-traveler, a co-pilot that actually you want to go into business with. I mean, that's a pretty unique formula. Yeah. Is, is there a lesson for for other people? Do you think from from your story in that respect? I think I think my mum is very good at trusting people and trusting younger people, and I think that's quite a nice like segue. Like younger people generally have quite a good like ethics and thoughts about the environment, et cetera, and fresh thinking. And she's very respectful of that. And in the way we've kind of grown the business to try and grow it almost sustainably for the planet and for the environment, et cetera. I don't know if she would have necessarily thought about those points. And yeah. I think it's that kind of, those two different dynamics and two different viewpoints have probably come together really nicely. But you also had the dynamic of the artist and the scientist. Oh, she's the emotional one. I'm like the let's get stuff done one. Right. That's kind of how it works. She's like foot to the floor. I'm like, okay, let's make sure it's okay. <laughs> do, do you both identify as entrepreneur? Um, I don't know. I'm very, I, I don't know. What, so what's, like p paint the picture. You, how big's the office? You sit next to each other. You work independently. Like, yeah. Um, so we, until about three years ago, we worked from our house and then we moved warehouse twice and now we have our office in Birmingham. And vaccine. how many staff? What's the size of About that? About 76, 78, I think. We had two new people this week. Um, and that's split across customer service and also warehouse. So we have a warehouse in Telford. Um, and Maxine comes in. She brings the dog, actually, which everyone loves. <laughs> this dog is roaming yeah. around the office. It's a bit bizarre environment, to be fair. Um, but she dips in and out of our kind of trading meetings. She doesn't come to all of them. Maxine's more... I call her Maxine. I have them since before AC as well. Right, freaks so, people out a little bit. So you can't call her mum? No, I don't call her mum. Mum? Uh, uh, bit, uh, bit weird. Uh, uh, so, <laughs> but, but you've built a high-performance business. You know, you're on the Sunday Times 100 list of fast-growing growing companies, fourth in that list, um, Forbes 30 under 30. You know, if you were saying, well, actually, we built a fun business, which I'm sure it is by the sounds of it, but you've also built a high-performance business, a business that has got hold of an emerging issue and you've got hold of it quickly and you've grown it quickly. I mean, the business has been, has been established for, what, sort of six, seven years, something like that, 2017. Yeah. Um, how much have you had to learn along the way? And have, how, have you, how have you actually adapted to that rapid yeah. growth cycle? And then there's a question before that, right? Because you, you talked about kind of, you know, the university laboratory, like looking at bone broth under a microscope yeah. is how I'm Im imagining it, to then ordering... 8,000 milligrams, micrograms of marine collagen. Like, the what's the step? Spark. What's the, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of questions there. Let's break them out. Let's go, let's go to the spark first. Let's, let's, let's start there. The, the spark to actually think, well, actually, I could do this as a business. We've never had the attitude that we can't do anything. And I know that's really quite naive. And we always, because we're based in the Midlands, I think when you're in London, you speak to people and you get the kind of buzz between businesses, et cetera. We didn't really have any of that. So we were quite isolated in ourselves. So for us, it was like, okay, we've got this product. I remember just we just ordered a ton of collagen. We're like, I'll just order a ton of collagen and we'll just make it happen. And then there was there was teething issues. We had it in different formats in the beginning. It was really hard to blend and like we had a lot of problems. But it was almost I remember reaching out to Trading Standards and they were really excited because they normally 
look at like brownies in someone's kitchen. But they were like, oh, this is this is fun. So they were like on board to help mm. us. The DIT even, they helped us loads. So there was never any like, oh, we can't do this. And I know that was really silly. Um, but we never really had a business plan either. It was just, we have an amazing product. There's no one out there selling it because there wasn't at the time we were first to market with our product. Um, how do we get it to as many people as possible? In December 2017, we turned the website on and no one brought anything. And I was like, why is no one buying this amazing product? We weren't marketing it to anyone. So it makes sense as to know why no one was buying it. Um, Meta was in its infancy. Our CPAs and our cost per acquisition was really, really good. We were able to scale really quickly through those platforms. Um, so for us, it was just, we had a really good team at that point. It was me and my mum, um, a guy called Brad, who did all our tech and um, system stuff. And my partner actually has always done accounts. It, it spans more than just my mum, basically. Well, well it's uh, family business in, in many ways. But I, mean, <laughs> but I mean, I suppose the thing is, and, and and although I asked you to talk about the growth journey, let, let, let's, let's hold that for a minute because, you know, you've done a science degree. One of the, you'd expect scientists to go on and become scientists in very large corporations or for the government or in, in sort of um, institutions you've chosen to become an entrepreneur. It, it sounds to me like there was an amazing support structure around you, which might give us a clue as to, as to why. But do you think, did, did, you, did you think my path is always going to be to be my own boss, build something? I mean, was that, yeah. was that at, at the heart of this? So my dad set up a business when he was 16 and sold that when he was 50. So I'd always seen that kind of process. So he owned like a, it was like a glass manufacturing place. Um, I'd always done stuff. I've wrote, I've written a cookbook and got that published when I was like 16. And then I used to sell that. And I, I used to always do random things. I was quite obsessed with things. And I I'd can always absolutely tell you, I'm a dad of two girls and they're going to listen to this podcast. <laughs> and it's the last thing they do. <laughs> um, what an extraordinary story. <laughs> yeah, I've always tried to do things. And I think I'm, if I want something, I'm just like, we'll just figure out how to get it. But it sounds to me like, like the structure around you was a very important part oh, huge. of how you, how you had the sort of like, you know, taking that step because it's not it's not for everyone to to go off and start a business, is yeah. it? Yeah, no. The the people we have around is is are insane, and the people we had at the beginning of AC also the suppliers we have at the start, the ones that actually believed in us. Because some nineteen year old girl and her crazy fifty year old mum approaching like, oh, can you blend this product? Bit strange. They didn't mm. really because they do trust the big pharma companies and the people with more established experience. And the people that trusted us at the beginning are generally the people that we work with now, which is a really great, nice piece to have. What does the wider program say, Charlotte, about structure around entrepreneurs, support networks, peer groups, that kind of thing in terms of actually how you can weather what can often be quite a lonely journey? I mean, it's really, really important. And one of the key strengths of the 10,000 Small Businesses Program, right, as you know, Darcy, is the, is the peer-to-peer network mm. because it's really lonely. You don't necessarily want to unload your woes and challenges on your team underneath you. And so having that peer support base is invaluable. But I think I think what's what's also fascinating about what you're saying about going back to your, to your mother dynamic and enabling you to have the freedom to do anything that you wanted when you were growing up. And I guess with freedom also comes responsibility and, and, and accountability and a kind of management of risk, which I guess are also traits that you took through with you as you set up set up the business. Mm. You know, I think in kind of sitting next to you and having known you for a, you know, a few years now, just a huge maturity. But you built a business at the age of 20, you know, you've been at the right place at the right time and you've made a market. Um, was there a moment in time where you thought, well, there's, there's something in this? Well, when was the moment? Because obviously we know this brand now, mm -hmm. we see it on TV, we see it in lots of different places. But when was the moment when the kind of like the, the startup dream yeah. started to look like being, wow, quite a reality? I think it was when, so in February 21, we started to look at investment. And before that, the way we'd funded the business is my mum actually, Maxine, remortgaged her house. Um, and that's kind of how we funded it because we didn't understand that investment was even a thing, to mm. be honest. And looking back, massively crazy, silly idea, but it worked, so we're okay. Um, and it was that process of going through investment and being able to attract top investors that actually wanted to take our business seriously. Um, 
and really like good money coming into our company with people that can offer huge value adds there. I think that was the point where I was like, oh, this could actually this could actually be something really great. I still don't think like we've made it or we've done it, by the way. Yeah, we yeah. have such a long well, way I mean, to go. I mean, a lot of entrepreneurs feel that. <laughs> and, um, that. When they say you've done really well and they think in your own terms. You think well, just, let's just go back to that in- investment moment. Um, what triggered that? What type of yeah. investment and how did you think about it? It was really, so I think we were around, um, turning over probably 15 million at the time, probably around 20 employees. And I remember me and Maxine were speaking and I kind of looked outside one day and we were chatting and every decision that we made then and pre that moment really only affected us. And there wasn't many people, but we were scaling fast and employing more and more people. And every decision we made then wasn't just affecting them, it was affecting their families, etc. Because if it all went wrong, then their jobs are lost or, or whatever. So it was about, okay, if we want to move this business to the next stage and scale it to the next stage, how can we mm. better proof that really? How can we bring the best people in? So the investment, like we did see brand, we're fairly profitable, cash generative. So it was more about bringing incredible people in place, which we have done from that investment. Do, do you think that, that your mindset has had to shift? Because you know, it strikes me that what you've had is a is an accelerated journey that a lot of entrepreneurs may may find over a great deal of time. You've done it really quickly. In terms of how you've had to change, have you, or actually, have you stayed the same, <laughs> do you think? <laughs> That's my partner. Um, no, I think I've had to change quite a lot. I think I used to be quite a worrier. Mm. I used to kind of worry about every problem. I've had to really take myself out of that uh, I'm a lot more confident as a person. I love learning. That's what I've realized. I really love learning. And if I can learn from anyone, then I'm happy and I won't get bored. So as long as I'm always learning, I'm good. So you're, um, so you're an improver. So yeah, that, always that, want to improve. Right. <laughs> so presumably that's why, why you did things like, like the course, right? Yeah. In terms of actually getting better. I mean, in terms of how you built a better business, though, I mean, you've you've also taken this business to another level very, very quickly. In terms of how you've promoted it and how you've grown it, mm-hmm. how have you sort of moved from being a, a scientist to an expert marketeer to an expert business builder? Probably employed incredible people, to be fair, to support us. I'm not an expert in anything. I think I'm quite a generalist in, in lots of areas. I love to learn. I'll always try and learn the best I can do. I remember like pre-lockdown, I do like Facebook courses on the weekends and the evenings, etc. But that isn't my skill. It's not what I'm good at. So we've always been really great at employing really awesome people. One of the biggest kind of um, marketing strategies for Absolute Collagen is really our referral program. Mm. Um, And that's more word of mouth, not like something that we're orchestrating, etc. But if you look at our data and in Google and our analytics platforms, it's Google, it's Facebook. But when we speak to customers, 40% of them referred by friends, which is quite astonishing, really. So that's kind of how the company is sort of Grown. But also, Charlotte, high, highly targeted campaigns. I mean, you're seeing, highly you're tar- seeing, these, you're <laughs> I seeing don't know what you're saying, Michael. Everywhere, aren't you? <laughs> but I mean, digital marketing, right? In terms yeah. of clever marketing. Well, I mean, absolutely. Um, you know, I've been uh, on ITVX <laughs> recently in all their spare time. Uh, I should be doing more Facebook learning. But absolutely, I mean, the ads that I see are absolute collagen. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I proudly sit there and say to my husband, that's 10,000 10, small business graduate. Um, I mean, it's it's ext- extraordinary. And it, and it really does picking up on what you've said, Michael, in a very short space of time, you know, you are everywhere. I mean, you are one of the UK's biggest success stories at mm. the moment in terms of high growth, scale up, extraordinary businesses. Um, and I see a huge amount more growth ahead, you know, both here in the UK market, but also internationally. And just, just talk to us, I guess, about that international piece. Mm. Yeah. Do you have an international footprint? Are you, are you thinking about it? This is really what the 10K, uh, 10,000 small businesses actually taught me. And one of the biggest lessons I probably learned from it was we were doing so much stuff and trying to do loads of things. And actually that the course made me like really look up and see, okay, there's actually five priorities here that we really need to kind of take hold of and do properly. Uh, and one of them was letting go of international actually at the time. Um, to focus on the UK, like we know our three biggest areas are new products, customers, uh, new products, new customers. And then in that existing base, like we're subscription. If we can get every customer to stay for an extra two weeks, that's huge. Um, over over time. Um, but now we're really looking at that international growth again. Like we're direct to consumer. So it's 
Um, I think everyone at AC would kill me if I said this, but it's fairly easy to set up marketing. It's just the the food legislation and getting that sorted across boundaries, etc. So we're currently just investigating different markets, Canada, <laughs> um, Europe, Australia, etc., um, just to see where we would have the best kind of footprint and best success because we need someone that's a demographic that's got a bit of spendable cash. Um, they buy on social, they buy health food products online. There's quite a lot of niches that we need to ensure mm. are okay there. So we're at our last question. Um, and we could go on on so many different sort of uh, areas and areas of focus. But I, I guess, Darcy, thinking about your story is that, you know, there's a lot of people would, would love to emulate a fast growth story. There are policymakers that will think, you know, we need more Darcy's, we need more absolute collagen businesses. And because that's at the heart of what it takes to make Britain a great place to to grow a to grow a business. You know, if, if I was to put you on your soapbox for a minute in terms of the message that, that you want others to hear about what it takes to create more businesses like yours. I mean, is there can the scientist identify a formula um, that, that can be shared with with others as yeah. in terms of actually what it takes to go big and make it happen. Yeah, I'm a big believer that you need to be really passionate about something. And that passion could come from, and it's not from me, but money or whatever that might be. But I obsessed about absolute collagen for the first, I still do, to be honest, but I don't see it on my laptop by my bed anymore, so it's probably slightly healthier. Um, but I loved every single moment of it. And for me, it wasn't like a chore. And it was something I really genuinely wanted to do. And there was nothing that was going to get in mine or Maxine, my mum's way in making it happen. Um, we had a real clear mission that we wanted this product to get to as many women as possible. And it was never like, we want to sell a thousand boxes or whatever. That was never really a thing. It was more just like, we have an amazing product. How do we share it with as many people as possible, um, really? Darcy, thank you so much for joining us on Changemakers, sharing the story of Absolute Collagen, a business of our times. What a great story. Congratulations. Thank you. 